Very nice. Not windy, not rainy, not cloudy. So let's enjoy the day as we celebrate and as we worship our Lord together. Uh, first thing we're going to show you, though, uh, this month or next Sunday, excuse me, we're going to go ahead and start collecting for Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And so we established a church goal of $250. Um, so to get us a better understanding of what this offering goes to, uh, I have a quick video of a couple, a married couple who's uh, reaching out somewhere in Northern California, I believe. And let's go ahead and watch their, their work and how uh, the Annie Armstrong offering goes to support their work. In our town right here, it's kind of sad. There's been a lot of shootings, a lot of people getting killed. And um, it looks nice, but it, it's a little rough. I grew up in Sanger. It was just, you know, drugs, alcohol, in trouble all the time, in and out of jail. And that's where I surrendered my life over to Christ. I gave up. I said, God, I, I know you didn't create me to live this kind of life. I just give my life over to you. Do something with me. Ever since then, it's just been, there's no going back. It's all Jesus, man. Before we started the church, he's like, we're going to plant a church. And I looked at him and I said, you are crazy. Like we were in such a tight financial position that I'm like, there's no way. I got connected with Southern Baptist and we were able to get funding coming in. So we planted a church. We're more of a laid back church. You know, it, how you look on the outside doesn't matter. Some of the people that come to our church, if they were to visit your church, you guys might be a little scared of them because they might look a little rough, a little tough. We try to get people that are on the street to come to church. We had that opportunity where we feed people. The food draws people in and, and the food is our way of using it to share the gospel message. Because that is our number one goal. Seeing these men, these women, these, these children, to see the joy in their eyes when they realize and they recognize that they're not alone. It's just building those connections and, um, and letting people know that, you know, they're loved. What Pastor Jacob has offered us is a, is another opportunity, you know, that, that the world was not going to give us. Because all of us were wicked men at one point in our lives. But this man looked past all that. He just shows us love that the, that the world didn't show us. Because of the giving of Nan that we've been receiving, we're not left alone. That's a blessing and it helps us just to keep going forward. Being the church to the community, to our neighbors that are right across the street, showing love to them, you know. That's just what it's all about. I think it was Sanger, California is where it was. So, but that's what we go to support, uh, you know, North American missionaries who are out there starting new church plants. And uh, we're just so privileged that we get to partner with all the other Southern Baptist churches to give to this offering. Uh, so let's go ahead and pray. And then if you're stand, if you're able, and we're going to uh, sing a song, let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for bringing us here together, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate all that you have planned, all that you have stored for us, Lord. May we just rejoice wherever we're at today, Lord. May we just realize that the love of Jesus Christ resides in our heart, Lord, and it's up to us to express it uh, to other people, but also express it to you, Lord. Our words that we sing, our prayers that we, we do, Lord, are to bring glory and honor to you. And may the light of Jesus continue to shine amongst us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow tries to steal the joy I when brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Uh 
Just a few announcements we have here uh, this morning. 
Uh, again, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering goal is $250, and we'll start collecting next week. Uh, we'll also, uh, for those of you who give online, we'll also put a little option where you can give to your Annie Armstrong and give to your regular general offering as well, if you'd like to do that, or for those of you who join us online. Uh, just a reminder, this Saturday, no church cleaning. <laughs> we got some applause that there's no church cleaning Saturday, so thank you. Um, also, uh, prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests, again, just talk to Marie, Melanie, or myself and let us know so we can add it to the bulletin. And every Sunday when you come, you can look at the back of your bulletin, and there's people that can be prayed for for whatever is, is going on in their life. But uh, we do have a lot of needs, so just make sure you uh, let us know so we can go ahead and share those needs. Uh, next Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday, so we want to encourage you to come and invite people to church. Uh, we can still fill People with church, we're at 25% capacity is our maximum, so we have plenty enough room to do that. Uh, but if you're also joining us online or people who can't make it or sick, you can let them know that they can join us online as well. Uh, reminder, for those of you who are giving online, you can go ahead and click on the uh, offering button, and it'll get you to the online giving. Uh, those of you who are here, just a reminder, we have the little uh, brown offering box in the lobby, and you can go ahead and put your envelope in there as well. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and continue. Uh, if there's no other announcements, uh, Melanie? Uh, so we're going to have something special for the kids. I can't remember what it was, but we're having it. So if you have kids, bring them. Okay? So if you bring them to church first time, it's, it's be great. Uh, Melanie, Marie, and uh, Lonnie are planning something. So we'll have something uh, available for the kids on that Easter Sunday. Thank you, Melanie, for reminding me of that. Um, any other announcements I may have forgotten? Uh, with that, let's go ahead and sing our last song, and then we'll get to our message. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Oh, there is no one like you. 
As we've gathered here together, Lord, to open up your word, pray, Father, for those who just need you so desperately here this morning. And I pray, Father, that each of us seeks us from wherever we're at, whatever point of life we've come to, whatever struggle we're dealing with, whatever feelings that we just cannot shake, Lord, may we build that foundation on our love for you. Father, your, your love is on the cross, Lord. Your love was given to us as a sacrifice for our sins and our wrongdoings. And Lord, as Jesus was nailed to that cross and as he died a horrible death, but he overcame it, Lord, by resurrecting that third day showing that he indeed has the power over life. And Lord, maybe some of us need to be resurrected in our own ways, in our own faith with you. And some of us have just kind of shut down, Lord, and not allowed you to come into our lives, Lord. We've been putting these barriers and, and not allowing you to take place and take root in our heart and our mind. And I pray, Father, you would do that to each of us here this morning that we discover that passion, that love that we need to have for you. And know, Father, that that love is so real, Lord. It's a, it's a love that can only be embraced 
It's a love that cannot be shaken. It's a love that cannot be taken away. And so God, open up our hearts and minds to the reading of your word. Shape us into the person you want us to become. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We have been talking about the road to the great comeback. And I just kind of point out the few stories last uh, week. We talked about uh, Jesus and him being the, the, the sheep, you know. He, he talks about the sheep, and he's the shepherd of the sheep. And we got to a point in John chapter 10 where there was a question that nobody asked him, right? And he goes ahead and answers the question as to why he came. And he says, I came so that they may have life and that they may have it or more abundantly. That's why he came. We understand what Jesus' purpose is because nobody ever asked him the question. He just wanted to tell people what he is. But one thing we realize about Jesus is that not only did he come to save us, but he also came to forgive us. He also came to forgive us. And that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. Because I'm sure there's things you've done in your life and things I've done in my life that have not been <laughs> so forgivable, you know. Words we say to our loved ones, and sometimes we don't really mean it, it comes out, right? It's, you can't take it back, and you know you need to be forgiven. But uh, maybe when you were a little kid, like I was, uh, you would steal things, right? Little kids tend to grab things. I remember taking our kids to the store, and my son, who was the youngest one, he would grab things, and we'd have to make sure by the time we got into the line to pay for things that he didn't have something he wasn't supposed to. But I also remember also as a young kid that um, in cereal boxes, uh, remember they used to give prizes, right? And sometimes you'd have to mail in the prizes. You, in, in the cereal box might be one or two things you needed in order to get the prize. And, you know, it's basically so you can buy more sweet cereal, you know. And so I remember one time, I, um, I think I needed three stickers or something to get the prize, and I had two of them. And I was missing one of them. And, you know, of course, you know, again, you're eating the cereal fast so your parents can buy you new cereal. Um, but I was missing one sticker, and I remember I was at my cousin's house, and in his bedroom was the one sticker I needed. Oh, there it was. You know, I wanted that prize that they uh, wanted to give me. I think it was honeycombs or something like that. You know, I, I just needed this one sticker I've been waiting, waiting for, and I had to take it. <laughs> so I took the sticker and uh, mailed in the prize. But when you think about it, it's like, that's really stealing, right? It's really... Uh, you know, robbery, you know, we talked about that last week. I mean, have you ever stolen something in your life? How many of you have gone to the grocery store and you go buy the fruits? And remember the grapes? Oh, I'll just take one of them. You know, you just want to pick one of them. Yeah, now a lot of you are going, oh, i got some confession to do now. That's why they put them in the bags now. But sometimes we've done our own stealing and sometimes we violate the law, right? When we drive, we get a ticket, stop sign, speeding, uh, going, you know, making a left turn or a right turn where you're not supposed to. You get a ticket. You'll get a fine. If you steal something, you know, you might get jail time. Uh, you might have to pay restitution to the person you stole it from. Uh, you know, there's uh, fines that you might have to do as a result of what you've done. But imagine if you were a thief, a robber, and you had stolen something, you've done this, and you've been a criminal probably all your entire life. And finally, all that life has gotten caught up with you. And now the punishment is going to be this. The cross. The punishment is that you are going to die by the cross for your crimes. And so we're going to watch a story about two criminals who were nailed on the cross. And we're going to watch their reactions. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to me to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32, is where I'm going to be this morning. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32, and we're going to go all the way to verse 43. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32. The Bible tells us this. Two others who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. Uh, Luke is telling us that there's these other guys that are along with Jesus who are going to be 
with him. Jesus was to them a common criminal. To us today, we know he wasn't a common criminal. In fact, we know that Jesus was innocent. He wasn't worthy of the punishment he was going to take on. Jesus also underwent the quickest trial in history. It was done very quickly, secretly, at night, and done. And the Bible says this in verse 33. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And when we read the scripture, you know, there's that word crucified. And to those readers of the New Testament time, they would know what crucifixion was. But to us today, right, we don't know what it is unless you're, you know, you've been in church a long time or, or study the history where they crucified people. And so to them, you know, the writers of the gospel did not have to explain what crucifixion is. But for us today, reading this in our Bibles, we have to get an understanding as to what crucifixion is. Crucifixion meant they were put on a cross, some say a T like what we have here, or maybe an X, and they were nailed on this cross. Their ankles were kind of put together and they would have to be twisted so that the nail that they drove would go through both ankles. And it would go through their ankles and through the wood. And there would be a little platform where they could raise themselves up by bending their knees to catch a breath as they stood on the cross hanging. The arms would be spread and horizontally, and the nails would be put in the palm area on each side. If you've ever seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, you'll see them do that. And what's painful, if you ever watch it, is they put the nails through, and that's painful enough. But then they turn Jesus over, face down on the dirt, and nail the backhand so the nails don't come out. It was a cruel death. It was humiliating because the place where they're at is on a hill where everybody could see. It was probably sometimes hot, and they would die of asphyxiation, you know, basically, you know, choking themselves to death as they tried to breathe, or also because of the loss of blood poured out from their ankles and their, their palms. But we must remember, before even Jesus gets to this point, he's been beaten bruised, he no longer looks like Jesus anymore. And he's put on there practically naked. He may have a garment, they say, around his waist. And he has the crown of thorns, right? Because they made fun of him, calling him king of the Jews. So here's your crown of thorns on his head. Very sharp. Now, with that understanding, we understand that this is a very cruel death. It was something the Romans were, were known for. Horrible, painful, and humiliating. And sometimes it would take hours before the person actually died. So with that in mind, we see that Jesus was up there with these two criminals. And in verse 34, Jesus says a prayer. Check this out. It says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they cast lot, lots to divide his garments. My question here is, when I read this verse, and I've read it numerous times, is who is he praying for? Who is he asking the Father to forgive? And I believe it's two people, two groups of people. Number one is the religious leaders, the Jews. They're the ones who orchestrated all this so that Jesus would be crucified because he was interfering with their business. The other group he's talking about is to the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers had to carry out those orders given by Pilate to hang him. Because we know that the Romans could only have one king, and that was Caesar. To have another king would have been a problem. 
You can't have two kings in a castle, right? So to this, Jesus is asking for this prayer of forgiveness. But it's this road to the great comeback that Jesus has to go, yet he's asking for prayer for forgiveness. Then Luke continues to write in verse 35, he says, And the people stood by watching. People are watching what's going on, watching the criminals being crucified, but watching also Jesus. And in those days, you know, this was like a common event. I mean, come on, most of us have gotten on the freeways, right? How many of you have driven a freeway? Okay, all right, all of you. And how many times have you been when there's an accident on the freeway? And what is everybody doing as they're passing by the accident? Looky loose. Right? I get it. You should slow down because there's emergency vehicles. But people are like almost stopped, right? And then what happens when you pass the accident? It's free. You know, you can drive as fast as you can. And that's what we have here. We have people watching what's going on. We have looky-loos, like you said. We have people that are watching on because this is a common occurrence. And so those, we have people watching, but look who else is there. It says, but the rulers scoffed at him. The religious leaders of that time, the Sanhedrin, the high priests, all these other groups of rulers in the Jewish community are making fun of Jesus. Look at what they said. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. They're making fun of him. They're ridiculing him. If he saved himself... If he's the chosen one, let him save himself. Let's see what he can do. But they're not talking to Jesus. They're talking to the people around them so that they could look good. Because in their mind, Jesus is going to die and all, everything's going to be fine. We'll be back in charge, uh, in charge again. And remember, Jesus had the harshest words for those who were religious leaders. Because they should have known better. They should have known better. Jesus was not kind to them. But their own selfish desire to keep their own rule in their Jewish community and to be able to be looked upon as the authorities in their religion, in Judaism, was more important to them than what Jesus had to say to them. But then in verse 36, we have another group of people. It says this, So the soldiers also mocked him. So the Jewish leaders, the rulers are, are getting on him, and now the soldiers are piling it on. You ever picked on people? Right? One person kind of starts it, right? And the other person says, yeah, 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 yeah. Him too, you know. The soldiers are now involved. They're also mocking him. They don't care about the Jewish religion. They are just having fun. But look at what the soldiers said. Something very interesting. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine. Sour wine is basically they're giving him the box and the wine, the cheapest wine. <laughs> and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. They're making fun of him. But they're also saying, hey, if you're truly king, save yourself. What neither of them realized is that the one person who could save them was in the process of saving them. The one person who could save them was in the process of saving them. He was in the process of being sacrificed for their sins and our sins today. Jesus was a threat to their leadership. And so the crime of Jesus stood over him and it read, look at verse 38. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. His crime being king of the Jews. That was his crime. That's why he was nailed on the cross for. In everybody else's mind. For everybody to see. To be humiliated, mocked. By these people. But also, we have another group of people who are going to 
heap insults and mock Jesus. And it's the two criminals. And so go to verse 39. There were, uh, one of the criminals who were hung, who, who were hanged, railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Again, if you're the Christ, if you're the chosen one, if you're the Messiah, save yourself. And by the way, can you also save us? <laughs> Earlier on, the other criminal was just as bad. But at some point in this process, one of the criminals' minds was changed. Verse, uh, verse 40. But the other, the other criminal, rebuked him. That re word rebuked is very strong. It's a word that Jesus used often to rebuke Satan. And so it has a very strong connotation. A very powerful word. So the criminal was not nice and say, hey, can you stop that? He didn't say that. Can you stop that? You know, it's basically what he's doing. He's rebuking him for what he said. And he says, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Perhaps his circumstances, this particular criminal, had changed his mind, knowing that he was going to die at some point. But he was firm and stern and he carried a tone which the Bible calls rebuke. He called the other criminal out. But let's see, why did Jesus forgive this criminal? Verse 41 says this. The criminal goes on, he says, And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. In other words, we deserve the punishment for our crime. Here's your number one point. He admitted his guilt. He admitted his guilt. He admitted his sin. Publicly. <laughs> he admitted his guilt. And not only that, he admitted that the punishment I get is what I deserve. Everyone must have known of this man's crime. He was described in the other Gospels as a thief or a robber. We went over that last week. Have you ever met someone who's had a bad reputation? And like, so when something goes wrong, they kind of like know <laughs> who's done this, you know, who's the cause of this? These guys would have been well known. Everybody would have been well known. He openly confesses his guilt. He openly confesses his sin. But like I said, he not only acknowledged his, his guilt, but he acknowledged that he deserved the punishment that he was about to receive. And many of us are okay with admitting our guilt, admitting our sin, but maybe we don't like the punishment. We may not agree that the price of the fine for a ticket doesn't fit the crime. We may not agree that even though I was late on my bill that I should not get a late fee. We may complain that the penalty is unjust. But not this man, not this criminal. He confessed and he acknowledged his crime fit the punishment. But look at the latter part of verse 41. It says, but this man, meaning Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Isn't it interesting that this criminal recognizes Jesus' innocence? It must have been well known that this whole trial that Jesus went through was a sham. It must have been clear to some group of people that Jesus was clearly innocent of what he was about to suffer. In fact, even Pilate knew that there was nothing wrong with Jesus. He was innocent. Jesus didn't deserve to be there along with them. But look at what this criminal does in the very next verse, verse 42. It says, and he said, 
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What this criminal is doing is he's praying. He prayed to God. He's praying. This is a short, quick prayer to God. And when we admit our sins and confess our guilt before God, we need to pray. We need to tell him. We can confess it to each other. But we need to tell Jesus. Jesus, remember me. Jesus, come into my life. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knows the end is near. So he prayed to God. And then in verse 43 it says, And he said to him, he meaning Jesus, Truly. You need to underline that word truly. Circle it, highlight it, whatever you want to do. That word truly means it's a fact. What I'm going to tell you has significant meaning. He says, truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say in 20 minutes. He didn't say tomorrow. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. What does that mean? Jesus came to offer forgiveness and heaven. He came to offer him eternal life. I forgive you, come into the kingdom. What did Jesus say in John 10.10 10 again? I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He's putting the purpose of why he came into practice on the cross. I think we have to think about what's holding you back from experiencing God's forgiveness. What's holding you back from telling God your, your guilt, telling God your sin? What is holding you back from experiencing God's forgiveness? Sometimes it's selfishness. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes you, you think, oh, oh, you know, I'm going to get punished and I don't want to have to deal with that, so I'm not going to tell God. God already knows. 1 John 1 9, John writes this If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All the crimes that this man had committed. Forgiven. You get to come paradise. It's just another term for heaven. That's where you get to come. You've admitted your guilt. You've admitted your sin. You've prayed. You asked me to remember you. And now I'm going to give you forgiveness. And now I'm going to welcome you into the kingdom. I'm going to welcome you into the kingdom. One thing we have to understand here is that forgiveness is available to everyone. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care how bad you may have been or not have been in your life. Forgiveness is available to all people. Even those who have a punishment that is worthy of the crime they've committed. I always like to use the example as, hey, I can ask God for forgiveness for running that stop sign. I still have a penalty to pay, but God still forgives me. There's always going to be punishment for your actions in some way. I want to close with a quick story here. There's a police officer, I've shown this before, but there's a police officer who came home at night, came to their apartment, and found a man, she was a woman, inside her apartment. So she pulled out her gun and shot him. And this man died. The problem was, it was not her apartment. Maybe she was a little bit tired after work. 
maybe she wasn't sure, you know, maybe her house was an apartment or a condo, so, you know, maybe she just got disoriented, but that's not to excuse what she did. So she ended up shooting this guy, and he died. Now she's getting punished. If you've ever seen any trials, you know, there's always that time where the victim's family gets to speak up before the punishment is issued. And so the victim's brother, younger brother, speaks up. And let's watch what he says. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just... I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. I don't know how that man did it. 
but he just shared the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus did the same thing on the cross. You have to make a decision in your life to accept him or reject him. But Jesus is ready to love on you all that he can and all that he is. Let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Lord, the power of forgiveness is just amazing, Lord. You forgave that criminal on the cross, a man who was worthy of the punishment that he was about to receive. And Lord, to just watch this video of this young man who just wants nothing but the best for this uh, officer, who killed her brother. The best thing for him, for her, was to know Christ. And Lord, when we ask Christ into our heart, when we mean it from the words we say, And we confess our sins to you. And we experience that moment of being saved. We have gone from hell to heaven in less than a second. Lord, your word says that the angels rejoice over one who is saved. And Lord, may we remember that, that every person is worthy of your forgiveness. Lord, you have redeemed us. You have saved us because you loved us. Lord, help us to remember that at this time, that you forgave us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you again for joining us today, and maybe God has spoken to you this morning, and if he has, whether you're online or here today, just let us know if you feel God has been tugging on your heart, and we want to tell you how you can just get to heaven. You can just talk to him right now and just tell, Lord, I give my life to you, and if you want to do that, you can do that either just by letting us know or, or just please let, let us know. We want to show you how uh, God wants to do something great in your life. Um, so let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll sing uh, one last song. Lord, I pray, Father, that if there's anybody here this morning who's maybe contemplated their walk with you, Lord, maybe they thought their relationship was right with you, but Lord, maybe as they heard your word, they've realized that they've not led the life you've called them to lead. So, Father, I pray for anyone here today, anybody who's joined us, online as well, Lord, if they feel that God has tugged in their heart, Lord, that they would just give their life to you, that they would just say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, remember me, Lord. Come into my life. Change my life, Lord. Let me turn from my sins because I've been redeemed by what you've done on the cross. And Lord, just we know you change people, Lord. We know you want to do incredible in that person's life. Uh, you want to shape them and mold them into the person you called them to be, Lord. You want to be there in the good times and in the bad. Because your love never fails us. So we thank you, Lord, for all that you do. And we thank you for what you've given us. The opportunity to come to you by faith. Through Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost 
Was blind, but now I see. 